Welcome to BRP and today's event, we have Jonathan Ayres, our landlord tenant evictions attorney, and he is going to teach us all about evictions. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Adias. I'm an attorney uh, based in Dade County, Florida, but um, statewide uh we we go all the way from the, the edge of the panhandle to the bottom of the keys uh done evictions and handled cases all over today um i wanted to talk to you about something um based off of um it's like when you get the same questions the same concerns over and over and over you're like okay it's, it's time to talk about this and i talk about it often but people keep making the same mistakes. So <laughs> let's talk about it. All right. So I'm going to leave some notes here. And this is the takeaway that I want. I want everybody to remember. <laughs> Self-help evictions are bad. All right. What is a sub self-help eviction a self-help eviction is basically when you skirt the the uh power of the courts and you say i'm going to uh i have an issue with this tenant and i'm going to take matters into my own hands and i'm going to now get this person out by any way that comes into my mind so what usually happens is when somebody is kind of new to the multifamily, new to the landlord game, uh, they have an issue with their tenant and the tenant isn't paying rent. And that inevitably leads to some type of argument over text, over phone or in person. And oftentimes the landlord's first instinct is to call the police. So they call the police, police get there, and the police will inevitably, in the state of Florida at least, say this. They'll say, this is a civil matter. You have to take it and handle it through the courts. Okay? So even the police are not going to be able to help you if you have some type of landlord-tenant issue. You have to deal with the courts. It's a civil matter at that point. So some people, unsatisfied with the police's answer, they try to do what I just previously described as a self-help eviction. They say, you know what? Forget the police. Forget everyone that's telling me that I have to go through the courts. I'm going to just do what I want to do. And the courts be damned, the system be damned, and I'm taking matters into my own hands. And that leads us to this over here. These are the prohibited practices under chapter 83.67 of the Florida statutes. Now, let me just say this. This is Florida law. I'm a Florida attorney. I'm only barred in Florida. I, I'm an expert in Florida law and I can't speak on any other uh, state's laws outside of that. But I will say this. I did my own research prior to coming on and I found that pretty much every state limits or outlaw or outright uh, bans self-help evictions. So although this, these, this is a Florida statute we're going to go through, and although I'm talking to you based off of a Florida, Florida expertise, if you perform self-help eviction anywhere you go, you're probably going to run into trouble. Let me say this. There are cities that have rent control. If you try to go through an eviction in one of those cities, uh, a self-help eviction, rather, you're really going to have an issue. So we're talking Oakland, talking New York, uh, probably L.A. I'm not 
familiar from from uh, personal experience, but I know those other ones for sure. So this is uh, chapter 83.67. And you know what? I was going to skip to the good part, but let's go to the good part initially. 83.67. So you guys, you're probably like, ill a Florida statue, a law. We're going to go through that. That's boring. That's lame. No, Florida law is sexy. Everything about Florida is sexy. You know, certain places have beaches. We have beaches. Other places have the sun. We have the sun. Okay. Other places have drama. We have drama. And this is where the drama comes from. So let's read subsection six. It says a landlord who violates any provision of this section shall be liable to the tenant for actual and consequential damages or three months of rent, whichever is greater, and costs, including attorney's fees. So in Florida, there we have some teeth to this. Rawr, okay? You mess up, you violate um, the rules then you could be liable for up to three months rent, okay? So let's talk about the things that you cannot do. And again, why do I go through this? You might think, oh, this is basic. But just yesterday, just yesterday, I was like, I got to talk about this because just yesterday I got a call from one of my clients who locked one of his tenants out. And I get these, it's, it's, I always say it's the same person with a different face. Um, so here we go. A landlord of any dwelling, I'm going to skip around so I don't have to read all the words, shall not directly or indirectly cause the termination or interruption of any utility service furnished to the tenant, including but not limited to water, heat, light, electricity, gas, elevator, garbage collection, or refrigeration. Have I seen this? Jonathan, have you seen this? Yes, I have. I've seen landlords in miami we have these things called efficiency apartments and they're basically uh people in in uh i was gonna say in hialeah i don't know if, if you guys are familiar with that part of town but all over miami uh people will have um their house and they'll add a little apartment onto the back well um it's they don't have their own utility box because it was just added it's it's essentially another room with an with an outside entrance that was added to the back so the utilities are the same uh for uh for the main house as in for the for the uh for the efficiency now i've seen where that's the case where it's the same set of uh of utilities and i've seen where they have their own utilities and I have seen where the landlord is like, okay, well, we're going to cut it off. I saw, I remember this one case where my client would go away for the weekends. And they're like, well, if I'm going to go away and I'm not going to use light and electricity and they owe me money, well, I'm just going to turn it off when I go out of town. And, <laughs> and I told the guy, I was like, hey, I don't think that's the best idea based off of, you know, you could get hit with a penalty of three times the rent. And he was like, hey, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that's my job as the advisor. I advise, but I don't hold a gun to anybody's head because ultimately you pay me and then you'll end up paying the penalty. So uh, this person was, uh, I think I ended up stopping him, actually. I think he ended up not doing it, but he was very, very seriously considering just turning off the water and turning off the electricity to the whole house because he was going out of town for the weekend. So first thing you cannot do, do not turn off utilities. <laughs> no turning off utilities. All right. All right. Let's get back to it. This I've seen a whole lot. Number two, a landlord of any dwelling unit governed by this part shall not prevent the tenant from gaining reasonable access to the dwelling unit by any means, including but not limited to changing the locks or using any boot lock or similar device. This is what happened just yesterday, okay? Just yesterday, I had this person who had electronic locks on the doors 
and he changed the, the code on the door. And just like that, it was uh, potentially an issue where potentially, allegedly, um, this there's an allegation that he uh, had prevented this tenant from having reasonable access to, to his unit. Now, um, there's some additional factors in that case, and that litigation is ongoing, so I can't get into it. But now with smart locks, um, it's that easy. Like back in the day, you had to have somebody physically come out, a, a, a locksmith physically come out and change a lock. Now you just go on the app, revoke access, and that's it. If you do that, you will be in violation of the statute. Also, one that I've seen also with an efficiency apartment, I saw that oftentimes with an efficiency apartment, they have uh, the, the tenant has their own entrance, like through the back. It might be a gate. I saw where one of my one of my clients put a lock on that gate. So the tenant was able to get into their unit, but there was a, an argument made that they no longer had reasonable access, reasonable access to the dwelling because by any means she blocked it. So this tenant was jumping the gate every time she wanted to get in and out of her house. Um, and my client's defense was I was, I didn't block her door. I didn't um, change the locks on her door, but I told her, look, you have to give reasonable access. And if she has to jump the fence every time, then that's probably a bad thing. And you could probably be liable under 83.67. All right. Uh, service member, that really doesn't happen. Uh, flag really doesn't happen. This does happen from time to time. A landlord of any dwelling a unit governed by this part should not remove outside doors, locks, roof walls or windows to the unit except for the purpose of maintenance repair or replacement this is what really happens and the landlord should not remove the tenant's personal property from the dwelling unit unless such action is taken after surrender abandonment recovery possession of the dwelling unit uh due to the death of the last remaining tenant in accordance with 83.59 so this happens a lot uh, i've never seen where anybody removes the door or a window but i have seen where people are like you're gonna get your stuff out and they wait till the person goes to work and the person goes out of town or whatever and they just grab all their stuff and put it on the curb or put it in the trash can or just take it out of the unit any way they they choose that is a no-no so Let's uh oh we 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 skipped one. We said no utilities. Um we said no changing locks and now no throwing stuff away. Okay? So in this case um man, I've seen this on so many so many occasions. Uh the worst one was where the judge really got mad at the client. This was before he was my client. The client was, um, he did this and then he came to me and he hired me. So he changed the locks, put the tenant stuff all out. And that was before the judge gave him an order and gave him a writ that said, hey, you can take this person out or actually give this writ to the police and they could come and do the lockout. And, um, and the judge, made the landlord give the tenant, in addition to any sanctions he faced, it made him give the tenant back possession of the property. And that's where I came in to actually finish the eviction. But after taking taking the guy out, cleaning the property up, the guy, the, the tenant went to the judge and was like, hey judge, this person kicked me out when we had an on we had ongoing litigation. And the judge was like, all right, now you landlord have to give them back possession of the property. So in addition to any sanctions he may have faced, which I, I honestly don't remember the sanctions he had to face. But the point is, that is a self-help eviction. You can't throw people's property out. 
And then we deal with this. If there are damages greater than three months of rent, remember it says whichever is greater. So let's say you take somebody's stuff, throw it on the curb, and you damage some device that they have. Let's say the person's working on a top secret uh, a medical device and they just, they're a crazy inventor, so they forgot to pay their rent and, and you just threw them out. If they can prove the damages, the actual damages of this of this item, you're going to be in a world of hurt um, because it's whichever is greater. So, again, self-help eviction is bad. You have to wait on the process. And I'm, I, I mentioned this briefly, but I'm going to go over it again. You get a final judgment from the judge, and that judgment entitles you to get a writ that you give to the sheriff, the sheriff still has to do the the lockout. So in places like Florida, excuse me, in places like Miami, that could take about three weeks. So oftentimes people will be like, Jonathan, we won the case. Great. That's awesome. And I'll be like, yes, that is great. And then they get upset because they have to wait. And I'm like, we got a lot of people getting evicted in this county. So you just got to wait. Now you go somewhere else, Broward, uh, maybe Orange County, in the Keys, and the police are on it. They don't have as much crime. We're, we're dealing with uh, uh, carjackers and, and drug traffickers and all types of crazy stuff. We can't be worried about evictions. Uh, so it takes time. It, uh, oftentimes, after a final judgment, it can take about three weeks. Now we have an expedited service, which is costs a lot more, and I'm not going to get into that. But it, this happens enough that I felt like today's uh, lecture, today's seminar should be on the basics of self-help eviction and how it is not a good idea, okay? Um, oftentimes, I have clients from different countries. And in different countries, uh, you know, you live by the, the sword, you die by the sword. Or in my country, you live by the machete, you die by the machete. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I've seen lots of uh, uh, mere machete fights uh, where I come from. And, um, you know, basically you tell somebody to get out and they get out and that's it. There's, there's, they have no, they have no uh, uh, way of dealing with it. They have no, you know, uh, retribution, no type of uh, uh, consequence to actions. Uh, not so here. And um, it could really end up hurting you. So you, as a as a wise multi <laughs> landlord, don't do this. Wait, and I know it sucks because time is money. But if you hire an attorney, it'll go much, much, much faster versus you trying to do it pro se, and um, you'll avoid the liability. So, can, can you explain what a writ is for people that may not know? Can I explain what what a writ is? A writ, yeah, so a writ is something that a judge will, uh, that the court will give um, for, in order to, to, uh, to, to, to basically say that someone else has to do something. So it, the only writs that you have to worry about, that's a, that's a broad definition, but the only writ that you have to worry about is the writ of possession, writ of okay? which is basically what, what the clerk issues. So Basically, our final judgments before the judge signs it says, hey, please direct the clerk to issue a writ. And so the writ would then be issued by the clerk and given to the sheriff. And then the sheriff would say, hey, this writ that was authorized by the clerk, which was ordered by the judge, is now something that we can use and legally cover our behind. If there's any issue with that writ, then the, the police will say, nope, we're not doing it. And you got to go back and fix the order or go back and start the lawsuit from the very beginning because um, police departments are always going to be on the C CYA tip. Okay. They're always going to cover themselves. And if there's some type of issue, some type of error, they're not going to go out on a limb for you at all. That's also why it's important to 
have an attorney. Let me tell you about one of my very first evictions. This was like seven years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it was an efficiency apartment. And on the, the three-day notice, this the three-day notice for non-payment, I did not put, I did not identify the fact that it was an efficiency apartment. So let's just say the address to the, to the house was 222 Elm Street. And that was the same address where the tenant used to receive mail. There wasn't a 222 Elm Street, you know, unit one. There wasn't anything like that. No, no demarcation whatsoever. So I, I, we gave that to the tenant at his efficiency door. He had a separate entrance. But when the writ came out and the judgment came out and everything came out, it just said 222 Elm Street. Well, guess who lived at 222 Elm Street? My client. So if the police were going to go there, they, it says, hey, take the defendant out and all others in possession from this property. So basically, <laughs> I, I made a big mistake. And it was one that I learned from and never made that mistake again. Uh, you, your mistakes start at the writ of possession and they follow you. And so basically what I would have had to do is start all the way from the beginning, serve a new three day notice, start a new lawsuit for possession, get a new judgment in a new case when that would, I'd have to pay another set of fees or my client would have set another set of filing fees and then, and then pay the sheriff again, their fee to come out. Luckily, wow. I, I bluffed my butt off and I told, I told the tenant, I was like, look, man, I gave this writ to the sheriff. They're coming for you. If you don't want your stuff to be on the street, I'll tell them to hold off until Friday, but have your stuff out by Friday or else I'm going to tell them to come on Friday. And he was like, no, 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 no. Okay. I'll be out. I'll be out. <laughs> I bluffed. And he bought it and uh, he moved out. But man, I totally messed that one up. So yeah, the writ needs to be perfect. Everything needs to be perfect. Police departments are dealing with lawsuits daily for different reasons. And if and when they go to serve the writ, they're just gonna follow whatever's on the writ, even mm -hmm. if it says, you know, everybody there has to move out, including the owner of the property. So that is my horror story on Ritz of possession. And will you touch on one more point? Because I know it's something everybody misses. The three-day notice. When does it start? How does that just run through that? Yes. One of my favorite things to do or talk about three-day notices, Karen. <laughs> let's, just, let's just go through this really quickly. Three-day notices. Okay. Here are the basic rules on three-day notices. Um, the day served does not count, okay? So let's say I served this three-day notice on a Monday. It does not count as one of the three days. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday will count, and I could file suit on that Friday. Also, holidays and weekends do not count. So if I serve a three-day notice on a Friday, then I count Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I could file my lawsuit on that Thursday. Okay? Here's another important one. Uh, fees are not included unless the lease says it is additional rent. So... You say, hey, uh, rent is due on the 1st. You have a grace period until the 5th. After that, you have to pay an extra 50 bucks. So then that person doesn't pay. The 6th comes around and you say, okay, $1,000 for rent plus 50 bucks of late fees. You will have to go all the way back because your three-day notice was faulty. The judge could dismiss your case and and you have to file again you have to serve another three-day notice because you basically included something that is not rent 
on a three-day notice. Three-day notices are only for rent. So fees are not included unless the lease says that additional fees are considered additional rent. Um, so those are some of the main things that you have to be careful of um, uh, when it comes to three-day notices. Those are the those are the errors that I see most often. And I never, when a client comes to me and says, I already did my three-day notice, I never take their word for it. I always want to see it myself mm -hmm. because I refuse. Um, I can't I can't prevent any mistakes that happened before me. But right. my job is to catch any mistakes that have been made until you got to me and make sure that there are no mistakes moving forward. So I'm not going to file a complaint make make you uh spend money on filing fees on a faulty notice that will later then get thrown out and i do not like being embarrassed so <laughs> i'll make sure that I, that I cross all my t's and dot all my eyes and that goes for the name say the name is jonathan Aris, but they spelt it wrong because it isn't spelled exactly the same as on the lease that can also revoke the three day notice uh, that that could be that's that could be call, called Scrivener's error. And uh, there's a chance where that's um, it's basically not fatal to your case. They'll so just uh, yeah. fix it. Um, okay. What I have seen is that people don't put uh, on a three day notice. They don't put all others in possession. So basically, when they get to the end, the, the cop, all they see on the writ is, you know, John Doe. And as long as they remove John Doe, then John Doe's sister, brother, cousin, friend, son can remain in the property. So it's whatever the judge signed off on. And the judge just said, hey, there's a writ for John Doe. And John Doe has to leave, but everybody else can stay. So they usually don't. And mm -hmm. because obviously, you know, I've, May, I may have bluffed my way out of that one time. I may have made an error, but like, oh, yeah, I got to leave. This says it right here. <laughs> but now I clearly put and all others in possession um, to cover my behind. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Any questions? All right. I guess seeing none. Thank uh, you, Karen. All right. This was awesome. We want to thank everybody. Thank you, Jonathan, as always. We want to thank our sponsors, Home Depot, Ed Koffler School of Real Estate, MyHouseDeals.com. And we would also like to encourage you to all sign up for your emails. Go to BuyItRentedProfit.com, subscribe to our emails, sign up, start getting some incredible knowledge, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Jonathan.